how you were talking about who is a geet expert. It's already recording when I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I went to ICCF 17 in the hope that I would get a chance to meet him. And unfortunately, he died uh, three weeks prior. And that was in 2012. So, um, but I, I've had various conversations with his family member, uh, his daughter, I think it is, and uh, I, over the years, and they have been following our work. And also with many of the scientists that worked with him. So, um, but yeah, he, he, he was a great man. Um, and uh, the four things that he was looking into, obviously, uh, what was labeled cold fusion was was uh, the one that got the most attention. Commitment. So, so uh, what, what did, did he tell you some things that, you know, maybe uh, weren't in the public domain that maybe uh, is, is a, you know, you, you're there, the things that motivated you? Or was it just the charisma of the man? I think anything that has enough um, impedance changes um, assists with protecting the the user or the device. Um, and so um, the the wool, I guess, uh, uh, it's it's a carbon based material, um, and it, it it's very fine, isn't it? So it will have lots of interfaces um, if you pack it in there. So again, with the husks, with I mean, the the husks are cellulose, so they might have some piezoelectricity, but it's actually the carbon in there. But the multiple layers, including the air and the oil, these different um, uh, transitions that the structures would have to go to go through would protect it, you know, protect the user or whatever. Um, so I'm not totally familiar with this particular um mode of construction but the the logic you raised it when i showed my shield that i use um <laughs> find it where you have a, a highly conducting metal aluminium and uh, a cellulose film and and 14 layers of those with air in between obviously these are all things i can rediscuss here because i've made them public but for you guys um and and they're all based on you know previous technologies so uh, but it's it's coupling the understanding with what you've put in there so i mean what was your original motivation for putting the uv in there the high frequency light in there what was the original motivation which rock are we are we talking about the limestone the, the marble the my, my reasoning for the limestone in in the pyramid is very simple it's the absolute best natural material you can use in a <laughs> it's an ether vortex machine and it is calcium carbonate and carbon, calcium, except for uh, the isotope 43, which is a relatively small component of calcium and oxygen. They are all non-spin matter. And when the vortex is created, um, it, it can pass through that without disrupting it. I have a brass sample, which was produced based on insight in an experiment last year. And it sat on an iron sample and it produced the vortex and the counter vortex, which is a macroplasmoid. It produced a visible ball lightning in the reactor and it produced a lump exactly in the center, one side, and went through a wormhole and punched through the other side in exactly the sacred geometry. It's absolutely, utterly precise. The, the, the geometry I was talking to you about, the sacred geometry, is basically magnetohydrodynamics, the same structure as your face. And it is the same structure as the basic form of the plasmoid, which has to be a minimum fractal too. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's exactly there. And we, we could produce these things every day of the week. And when you line it up with the pyramid, every single component lines up with every single part of geometry with the chiro, the Christ center, the center of the Maltese cross, exactly and precisely without a fraction of a millimeter deviation with the corner of the great step at the top of the grand gallery and when you understand that the the the, the bit that does the matter manipulation in the grand gallery also needs a chamber above uh, which will you can know the location of that and it, it the bottom of its spin is exactly and precisely above the top part of the groove. The bottom of the overall structure is exactly and precisely above the chamber that goes into the so-called queen chamber. And it's ne very necessarily towards the east, the, the 
uh, Grand Gallery, seven meters center towards the east. And the center line of the King's Chamber very necessarily has to go into the west because the matter that is synthesized in the so-called sarcophagus exactly in our experiments, which a three-year-old can learn to do in about seven minutes, it synthesizes the heavier matter precisely in that location. In nowhere else in this overall macro structure does it do that. So it breaks matter up on one side in the great, great gallery, and the whole spin vortex structure has the exact center at the top of the ground, it, and, and it's precise. It's not slightly precise, it's exactly precise. And the overall sphere of influence uh, is precisely located at uh, and, and the double layers are located where the granite blocks are in the ascending passage. And, and if every single aspect of that pyramid is perfect. You cannot make it better. And that is the truth of this technology. You cannot possibly make it better. So from my point of view, it's not so... It, it, it's nice to have a, a theory, you, you know, a, about maybe why you made a decision. I, I, I thought I was seeing things and I got the wrong idea to start with. And it took a lot of uh, looking at more things in nature and more things in experiments to realize that there was a pattern. And the only real important thing was the pattern that, uh, that occurs throughout everything. I didn't know anything about hydrodynamics when I started this process. Absolutely zero. <laughs> um, I knew water existed and I know you can have flow patterns in it. That was about it, right? And then when we saw these magneto, th these hydrodynamic structures in reactors like uh, this kind of one here, um, and they had substructures spinning in the same orientation, exactly like Celtic art. And, they, and I don't mean slightly like, I mean exactly like where the spin vortex goes in the same direction. It has se several nucleation points. It took a long time for me to disco discover that that is actually the the way that a superfluid moves now what is a superfluid doing bar boring through fused quartz in a reactor that's at about a thousand degrees centigrade what 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 on earth is it doing there and why has it got this hydrodynamic structure and then i learned about magneto hydrodynamics and then i learned that this can occur in the ether and um that it it, it can manipulate all matter and there's after a while there's nothing that can you know get in the way of it so if you look at the work of Paul Collock, and I, I mentioned this to you the other day, Paul Collock uh, has a patent from 1973, and it's the Plasmac patent. Obviously, it's open source. And he took a gas chamber with pul pressure pulse generators around it to contain the ball lightning that was synthesized. He injected a, a, a discharge with helicity. That means it's got some sort of vortex naturally going on in it. You inject it slightly at an angle. And um, before he did that, he used some form of pre-ionization. It literally does not matter what. Obviously, some methods of pre-ionizing the gas are better than others. The same process was done by um, Joseph Papp with the Papp device. Uh, the problem with the Papp device is he doesn't have carbon in it. If you don't have carbon in it, then you have to drain, drain the excess charge clusters. Otherwise, they will eventually cause failure of your metals. They will get into the metals, they will disrupt, disrupt the metal bond, and the metal will fail. And it will fail based on the conductivity, the magnetic nature, whether it's paramagnetic, diamagnetic, or ferromagnetic. Uh, and it will uh, fail based on things like the melting point and, and magnetic susceptibility. So um, I'm pleased to see you are using copper in your thunderstorm generator at least for some embodiments that i believe i've seen if it is copper i don't know whether that is because copper cannot absorb hydrogen it, it doesn't uh, absorb it and it's also diamagnetic so it helps keep these structures away because they have this it, it almost infinitely infinite boundary it has an event horizon beyond which there is zero magnetic field and inside there can be thousands and thousands of teslas um but the, the problem is it's actually a spin matter, both the 65 and, and, and uh, 63 copper is spin matter. And, and up to a point, it'll survive and then it'll get torn into the system. And, and uh, it just the copper gets shifted. So, um, you know, and, and th this thing 
when it's it, when it's driven beyond a certain limit, it will um, always consume the matter. So, the the what you don't you don't have the problem that Pat had. When Feynman went to see Pat before it was meant to be tested at SRI, uh, he pulled out this very fine lead that was attached to the wall, right? And in my view, that was the drain of the excess charge clusters. And uh, Pat let him take it out, and Pat, and Feynman goes, yes, yes, this must have been doing something. And he says, well, now can you put it back in the wall? It, it's still running. Can you put it back in the wall? And he says, no, I'm going to hold on to it like this. And then eventually put it back. It, it, he didn't put it back in the wall. But what happened was um, the, the cylinder head blew off. Um, something silvery as a blob flew through the air. It tore one person's body apart, ripped an arm or a leg off someone else. And at least one person died. I think two people were very seriously injured. Um, and uh, this, in Feynman's own account, the silvery blob turned into white smoke. And in my view, that was the, the cylinder. And the cylinder was overcharged with charge clusters. And when it went into the air, it instantaneously oxidized into aluminium oxide and it went into a puff of aluminium oxide. Um, uh, and so the observations and the, the metal chamber would have failed because of brittle fracture, and which I have samples where this happens. And, and it, the magnetic monopoles, they build up, which these things are, and they just tear the matter apart. They literally go like that. Um, so, th so the first point is that um, it's not that important in your case, uh, to have a grounding because you, you, you've you got carbon in your system. Pat didn't have carbon. He had just had noble gases. Okay. Um, the uh, So you're protected. Now, I'll give you another data point here. When I was testing Dr. Roshinamaza's gas, which is probably the best form of HHO gas that exists, um, if you expose tungsten to that it instantaneously starts to what they called vaporize so there was this sort of meme in the research community that hho was boiling tungsten therefore it must be above 3600 degrees centigrade or something so i went in there saying well that's what they say but let's 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 put a bolometer on it and it was actually it was it was that titanium was one and then tungsten was the other but one was about 230 degrees and the other one was 700 and something degrees but neither of them were anywhere near their respective melting points let alone boiling points and i did something that no one had ever done before was asked my ball lightning friend export dr george eagley to take a vacuum cleaner and on the end of the vacuum cleaner put um a face mask before they became fashionable. This was in 2019. Um, <laughs> and, and do what no one had done, which is suck in the vapors that were coming out from the tungsten. Now, when I looked at that tungsten vapor that was coming off, um, it had exactly the same transmutations as was observed on the 10, 15, 20 second exposed 2% thoriated tungsten welding rod. But on that welding rod, in those several seconds of exposure, there was exactly this sacred geometry structure. And precise, complete with the strange radiation coming out of the center of one side of the, the, the twin vortex. And it has this moment. And if you overlay the moment, it's exactly the, um, uh, the biggest chamber in the Great Pyramid, uh, which is the subterranean chamber. It's exactly there. And in, in fact, that is where it's disrupting matter. Um, and the um, this is also what I was talking to you about. It's exactly the point in Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower where he has the contacts on the secondary. And he says in his 1914 patent that if you move that just a few millimeters down or centimeters down, uh, or whatever he's using inches, uh, he says that it will produce a great ball of fire, which is highly destructive and dis destroy the apparatus, right? So I didn't, as I said to you the other day, I didn't teleport back into 1912, 13 and tell Tesla to put that into his patent. But I only were, I only saw this in his patent when I, when I realized it lined it up, lined up with that particular location. So um, the interesting thing is, and it also did this with um, titanium, it would bore through the titanium um, very, very quickly. Now, if you added 10% of a hydrocarbon to the HHO gas, 
the bolometer that we took, this is a thing that's able to see up to 1,500 degrees centigrade, registered far, far, far higher temperatures. Interestingly, the metals were not incandescent. They weren't like so bright you couldn't look at them. But the thermal energy was far higher. So they, they glowed orange hot, but it could not burn through and it did not transmute the tungsten. Okay? But it was actually thermally hotter. So this is a non-thermal process. So um, something that is bright glowing isn't necessarily actually that hot. You can't look at color temperature to determine temperature. So this is one thing. But adding carbon to these systems, um, it breaks the coherence because the carbon is highly diamagnetic and it, it shields other materials that, for instance, are metals and can be a free provider of the spin electrons and other spin matter. And it, it prevents them from a little bit of a runaway. So in that respect, you're, you're protected. So first off, I, I don't need to necessarily have a justification for having ionization. As I said to you to the other day, the important thing is, is, does this work and is it safe? Does this work and is it safe? Those are the two things that are important to the man on the street, right? If we're going to solve it, if the energy problem is real, and we want to play a role in solving it. Does it work? Is it safe? Can I afford it? Is the third one, right? <laughs> that, those the, are what is important. The, the, the frequency you're choosing is what? And it's designed to do specifically what? Looking at the, the UV spectrum that's coming yeah. from the bubble in, in, in Sonofusion. It's been going since the 20s or something. It's, it's a total learn of Canada. There's things on there you can search. But the, the reality is any pre-ionization leads to charge cluster formation and if if the when you've got the free electrons in there they will self-organize they'll form these clusters electronic structures at electronic speeds in the word of ken shoulders and uh, these are toroids of toroids and these can capture relic neutrinos from the environment and and make similes of themselves which, which become neutron uh, neutral clusters but they, they both have a, an intense magnetic moment and they bind to the paramagnetic oxygen. So what I was saying to you is the important thing is you're sucking in oxygen and you're creating some ionization. And so this was de defined by Paul Collock and he was clear about it's not important what ionization you have. So for instance, if you go to where I lived in Kerala for eight and a half years in Southern India, they have this um, one of the large largest deposits of monazite in the world. And this obviously has a lot of thorium in it and, and, and breakdown products and that. That ionizes the air. You would not believe the intensity of lightning storms that are, exist <laughs> in Canada. It's absurd, right? It's actually quite fun if you like lightning. And if you uh, looked at the studies of Ken Shoulders with uh, his exotic vacuum objects, he says that every single discharge and every single lightning strike starts with an Evo at the leader. Now, if you go and look at the, I think they're called the um, uh, high speed camera guys or something like that. They they go to that boat shaped thing in Singapore and they take lightning from the top of that at super stupid free frame rates, right? And you see the leader coming down and it then gets over energized and it splits and then it comes down and it splits and so on. And th these are ball lightning that are getting overexcited and dividing, which you can see in other experiments. And then the first one that hits the ground, uh, that is the overall ionization channel. And you have the discharges through the overall ionization channel. So it 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 doesn't matter how you arrived at something that works. Um, but I would argue that the, the important thing is you arrived at something that works, but there are many things that could work. And um, it's, it's about creating the more uh, uh, clusters possible. Now, when I visited Alexander Parkamov in, in 2015, in, and, and I, I described this in, in publicly, so it's fine. Um, uh, in his <laughs> 14th story Moscow, East Moscow apartment. <laughs> this guy worked for the Pro Atom for many years and was an atmospheric expert and a radiation expert. I was struck by this immense uh, ionizer he had in there. And then people weren't able to initially replicate his work. And then I thought, well, he, and it was absurd. It was home built and it had many and many of these arms coming out. In the case of Pap, he would actually use a, a gun and sorry, uh, um, yeah, Pap. He he would use radioactive sources. He would use 
um, a, um, a gun from a, a you know, a, a, a cathode ray tube, um, or he would even use, uh, it latterly in his patents, a um, Jacob's ladder within the device. It actually doesn't matter your source of creating static electricity. So I asked you, and I'll ask, because I asked you the other day, it would be unfair to ask you again, unless you've done any research. Does anyone know what static electricity is? Hmm. No. Anyone? Anyone actually know what static electricity is? Randall? Genuinely asking. I mean, I, I have what some people say, which I will offer, but I just wonder, because it's something we all experience in our day-to-day -day life. It's absolutely important to many things that happen. It, it, <laughs> but does anyone actually stop to consider what it actually is? Because electrons Randall. aren't meant to join together, right? So <laughs> that's a good hit. That's a, that is a good shot, yes. Um, anyone else? No? Okay, right. So I'll, I'll read you uh, something from Alexander Shishkin. Alexander Shishkin worked with uh, a guy called Dubovic at uh, uh, Dubna, and they're in a big team. And he was making a device, um, a cavitator for mixing oil and water. Okay. And I was describing this to Malcolm the other day, so I want to capture this for you guys. Um, he was just commissioned to make a device to make an emulsion of oil and water. When he was standing next to this guy's device, he felt really, really ill. Really, really ill. So as a radiation expert, he decided to put some X-ray film around it, and he found they got fogged, very similar to what was observed by early cold fusion researchers at the Barbara Atomic Research Center in India. OK, they still don't have an explanation for what that fogging is from the Baber Atomic Research Center. But it came out of cold fusion devices. And he what he found was that these these think the um, in these X-rays, they actually had these birdies. OK, and they literally looked like a mushroom sliced in half or more precisely. They look like the ancient lower part of the ankh below the loop. OK, and this is an exploded what they call magnetotoro electrical radiation, which they say with ions in tow is the same thing as an exotic vacuum object, which is the same thing as ball lightning. It's a magnetotoro electrical clusters. And these things in the neutral form, just like the exotic vacuum objects, because yes, they are the same thing, can travel through water, they can travel through metal, they can travel through air, they can travel through paper. And if they get excited at some point, they will blow up. And when they blow up, they produce this very distinctive uh, birdie, what they call a birdie, but it looks like a sliced mushroom. And so if you imagine a torus where all of this charge and ions are captured and it's self-contained, but for some reason it gets destabilized, when that thing unravels, you can imagine that it would come out as a mushroom. And if you slice through that thing, it would actually look like a, a little birdie with wings. Okay. What they found was is that the underneath the tail of these birdies, they found these pits in cellulose. And the pits in cellulose were the, the width and depth of, with a, with a factor of the atoms that the neutral structure had traveled through. So somehow these structures had captured the nuclei of atoms and when they disrupt, they eject the atoms and produce pits in the cellulose corresponding to the size and mass of the nuclei that they had captured. And this is over a nine year period from 2009 when they started investigating this with a big team at the Nuclear Institute in Dubna to 2018 when he gave that report. This is enough energy to hurt uh, sorry, destroy red blood cells and cause DNA damage in white blood cells. So this is the risk, one of the risks that I'm saying will be coming out and you won't know it's happening to you. This, in my view, is the same thing as the dirty etheric rays that Tesla witnessed in the 1890s coming out of his uh, unidirectional discharges. OK, and so when you get a unidirectional discharge and I, I described this to Malcolm, Tesla found he had to go 15 feet back and he's got these pinpricks in his body now. Um, Dr. George Eagley has anecdotes of the same thing occurring 
for people that get close to ball lightning. They get these pinpricks in, in their skin. They can actually feel these like explosions, like someone's put an acupuncture in. He did, didn't like this, so he sat himself behind a glass sheet. He still got the pinpricks. He then sat himself behind a um, copper sheet or a metal sheet. He still got the pinpricks. Okay? So what he found was that if he used any element above aluminium, he would get these pinpricks. And he ultimately found that you, uh, beryllium, um, magnesium, and aluminium were the only things that produced clean etheric matter streams. He found these eth etheric matter streams could then project themselves, they go in a flow, and they could go through solid matter, just as has been observed by Alexander Shishkin and the team at Dubna. And in another room, he could use his hand or his body or other things and produce on a zinc sulfide silver activated phosphor screen what looked like live x-rays, right? So he called this like dark light, okay? Now, this has been recently replicated, and we are also replicating it. Now, the very interesting thing is that Alexander Shishkin applied for a patent, having researched this with the team at the Nuclear Institute in Dubna uh, from 2019 to 2011. They applied for a patent in 2000 or till 12. In 2013, I think it was, they applied for a patent for a shield for this type of radiation. And what it was, was zinc sulfide, silver activated in latex and you can paint it onto materials, okay? They didn't keep, it's also strontium aluminate activated. Basically, it's a phosphor. And the important thing about having silver in there is it's the most conductive element. Go on. Basically, from exploding exotic vacuum object equivalents, Shishkin determined that soft X-rays with energies up to 10 kilo electron volts are constantly recorded under any rapidly occurring uh, mechanical electromagnetic effects on matter and associated with the formation and destruction of energy clusters. This is described in detail in one of his papers. Energy clusters are quasi-stable formations. They are constantly present around us, but fundamental science, as a rule, does not notice these formations. Energy clusters have gone by many names. Tesla called them radiant energy. Wilhelm Wright called them orgone energy. G Georgi Messiats called them ectons. Ken Shoulders called them charged clusters. Yuji Bajatov called them erzions. Shakparanov called them Kozirek Dirac monopoles. Uritskiev called them Loshank monopoles. But in everyday life, this phenomenon is called static electricity. Everyone has been dealing with the same thing. Sorry for taking up the time. I was not aware. That's what it is. Static electricity is all of this stuff that everyone's been discussing and inventing technologies from. It's just static electricity, and it's a quasi-stable cluster of electrons. They can lose their charge, and they can travel through matter, because I, I was under the impression we were going to be talking about safety, because whether it works is great. It either works or it doesn't. Yeah, for for me, it's the safety, because that's my expertise in, in this. In a plasma discharge water flow experiment at the Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute, they create monopole. They in it's a paper in 2019. They create the charge clusters, uh, monopoles at either end, and they have a loop. In these experiments, we create a loop. Um, the 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 monopoles can separate, and they have a flux loop between them. And one one can be on one side. And if you can imagine, you've got like on the sun, you get a, 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 a north and south monopole and it produces this solar prominence, okay? It's like if it's to there, it goes along the surface. But if it goes like that, it folds and goes through and out. In, it doesn't care about the ordinary matter. This is the same thing that I was talking to earlier about that brass plate with the thing going through the, the brass yeah. plate. So it, 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 when these things get energized enough, uh, ordinary, it, it, they just pass through ordinary matter. So I need to send you this paper uh, about the long-lived plas videos of long-lived plasmoids and the associated paper from the Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute. It's supported by our work. So it, the, the, these things will pass through ordinary matter, okay? And it, it, they, they have two ends. It's, I, I'm more worried about the ones that, 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 that are flying out. So, and the other point that we discussed was when it comes through your air brick, it comes through a pore, and that will cause turbulence. And the turbulence is absolutely key to further structuring your clusters. Carry on. The, what is the bubbler made of? The actual the brick or the just checking to see if it's something that could cause alkaline 
you know, increasing the alkaline nature of water. But but to speak to your um, your observation, if it's confirmed, there was a researcher that did aluminium rod discharges into water. He's Italian in the Lena field. And he found that it, it, in addition to synthesis of new elements, um, there was a, a an increase in alkalinity of, of the water. And he accounts the transmutations and the, also the production of deuterium from electron capture um, to um, the production of more OH minus, um, uh, sorry, o a OH ions in, in the water rather than uh, H, if you know what I mean. So um, it goes in that direction. I don't know why it would be occurring in yours if there's no electrolysis going on per se. To extreme lengths to explain what static electricity is, <laughs> which hopefully no one will forget now. Um, any form of ionization will create this. Um, ideally, you want to um, do an energy of over five electron volts to smash up hydrogen to create an already condensed relic neutrino cluster. But it doesn't really matter. You can create the the free electrons the through the ionization, assuming it's high enough. These will self-organize. Th these will bind to the um, paramagnetic oxygen, which is it's um, seventeen thousand five hundred times the the magnetic moment of I think uh, um, atomic hydrogen. Okay, so it's it's a really intense uh, device for capturing these magnetic structures. They go through with your oxygen that you're taking in from the air. The oxygen from the air, by the way, will also have some of these things in there all, all, already. And with the very nature of creating these toroidal structures, they will capture more from a event horizon for a certain distance around the, the, the ionization. That will go through into your bubbler. And the bubbler produces, um, as, you, as you go through a pore, it produces this exact structure you need. Uh, which is this uh, toroidal structure. And what that produces, if you've got charges going around like that uh, in in like a donut, that actually produces the toroidal moment. And the toroidal moment um, is something that was discovered by Dubovic in 1965, published in 1967, only recognized in the West in 1997. And it's now in all the major peer reviewed papers. And this can interact with the dark matter, which is the relic neutrinos, and it can cohere more. And we have a simple experiment called ultra experiment, which I mentioned earlier, within a eight seconds, eight cycles of 43 thousandths of a second, it already does this action. And so, and it's just with water on a metal, which is hydrophilic, you get easy water, you get the charge separation, but you end up with producing these current loops that go around. This is exactly the same as Bostic was creating in from 1948, which plasmoid term came from. He had a a deuterated titanium, 10,000 amp disruptive discharge, just like Tesla used. It produced a toroid. He had another toroid. They came together over a magnetic field. It's a toroid of toroid, and that produces a toroidal moment. You need a minimum of two. This is what I was talking about. But you'll be creating them in abundance, in my view, as it comes out of those little pores. So you've already got it in the oxygen. It's coming out, and you're forming the right structures as it's coming out. And um, uh, then, then it goes into your device. Now, you, uh, is it coming in to the cold end and you're putting the hot flue gases into the thunderstorm generator at the top at, at, with an oblique angle to produce the... the uh, I haven't, but I, I've studied GEET and the, the way that that claims to break up molecules uh, um, uh, to smaller fractions. I'm, I'm not an engine designer, uh, but what I can say is that the shape of the cylinder head in PAP cylinder head enabled the forcing of the magnetohydrodynamic dynamic structure. I think if every time you are trying to fight this thing that nature wants to do, you're going to make the life harder. So um, the, the structure is very, very simple. You can um, draw it yourself um, or, or I can send you the the diagram and you it's it is in your face and once you realize that that is the structure so if i was to design an engine using this i would have the inflow and the vortex projection into the device exactly as your face is designed which is exactly the structure of the 
And that, that I don't believe there's any easier way to do it. You, you know, nature spent four billion years coming up with this solution. Uh, you don't need math to, to, to invent a new solution. Um, you just need to know how to fix this into your device. I would be very happy to spend a lot of time looking through your designs. What I can say is nature's already solved this. And yeah. in terms of what um, fluidized electrons, which was something that Ken Shoulders claimed could be produced, we produce them in abundance and you can see it forms oh. a magnetic fluid. Uh, oh, wow. This is, this had a brass sheet above and a brass sheet ab uh, here with a gap in between. It produced ball lightning down the center and the fluidized electrons flow out. And in the end of the channels, you get hexagonal alternating red and green circular polarizers of light in the brass, wow. uh, which is exactly the structure of the physical vacuum, according to 1863 or four of, of Maxwell, right? And it, yep. it, you, right. you can't fake it. Now, what I was talking about, I think the most valuable thing, I, I mentioned to you that you will sit here in AM noise, uh, and one of the ways to determine the amount of charge clusters and, and the quantity of charge clusters is listening at an AM radio between stations. This was identified first, I think, in Russia um, with uh, observations of ball lightning. So this is not new. Um, obviously, John Hutchison used that as a method to uh, combine with the toroidal moment that goes on in the brain, which is just in brain being identified on the 15th of June this year and published in a major wow. journal. Um, he used his own psychic ability to, to, to work with that. So I had my, my reason for raising the question was that, uh, John talked about an AM signature. What was that? You said there was what an the AM signature coming from the reactor. But that's what I'm, that was why I raised my yeah. hand. Okay. So this should be expected. And I mentioned to, uh, Malcolm in our talk on, um, discussion on Friday that, you can use this as a detection method for, for the level of clusters in there. In our Vega experiments uh, with a potassium coated uh, um, tungsten wire and a large chamber, you can see these explosions. Uh, they are hemispherical. Uh, and when they explode, um, you hear this ping, right? You, there's an action auditory ping and the chamber body which you can see is warm it's in the hundreds of degrees is instantaneously cool instantaneously wow. cool and secondly uh, i suggested to the researcher to bring in an am radio to see if this was this explosion event and um uh, there were coincident pings and bearing in mind the thickness is i don't know about five six mils in this uh, cylinder it's going through an iron chamber and causing em interference um so basically when the cluster explodes when it goes in there it releases uh energy when the 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 electrons are condensing and when when they explode and the electrons come back and the matter comes back into ordinary space it has to extract thermal energy from the environment and you can clearly see it on the video it goes completely black and then you can see it heating up from the outside coming in and i mentioned to malcolm that is he seeing a a, a, a weird temperature inside his reactors when he's in, when inside the actual cylinder that's lower than the normal because you would expect when the clusters are building that they would be releasing energy and when they are exploding it's actually and this is what was going on in the pap device they 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 explode so this, I, I'm I'm interested in detection methods, and so when you mentioned AM, this tuned with my uh, understanding of these phenomena. Um, so you actually deliberately get get a shitty old radio and tune it between stations and and bring it close to the device, and you use that as a reference. Now, I also said to Malcolm that in the work of Alexander Parkamov here, he studied white noise, and he studied white noise over mm. extremely long periods of time. And then he recorded it on these very long form tapes and then he played it back and you can literally hear patterns. And um, basically all white noise, whether it's on a television 
or a radio is actually charged clusters that are inherent in the atmosphere blowing up, right? So your background white noise, your your white fuzzy stuff on an old CRT, or your white noise between stations is the EMPs that come from these things that are naturally in the environment that Malcolm is aggregating into bigger ones. So if he's working, you should get very much bigger hops, okay? The second thing is the actual plasmoid. Sorry, go on. We, we, we get, we, we get but you can see on the video, we actually get a defined pop. It's that when they are blowing up in the chamber. So we're seeing it on video and in 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 sequence, you're seeing the absorption of heat. Now in this in this reactor, when the charge clusters are broken up by a light bulb attached to a, a drain, the reactor recorded minus 273 degrees C for the copper on the outside for the, for the <laughs> thermometer. So it went to absolute zero. A lot of people attribute this to the vacuum and some weird rank Hirsch effects, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So that it's why I asked whether you were getting this temp temperature differential, which can be a problem for the, the way these work, right? They, they can cause problems with your efficiency. I don't know because I'm not the expert in engine designing, but I, I know things chemically need to be at suitable energy levels to ignite. And it, it might be that the, uh, in the PAP engine, it was a cold engine. It used to blow up the charge clusters and it, the, the shock wave would move up. It would form this uh, toroidal vortex, magnetohydrodynamic structure. He would extract so much magnetohydrodynamic electricity, he had to dump it into many kilowatts of resistors. He was just after the mechanical force. So using a uh, K-type thermocouple uh, uh, calibrated. In fact, it was it, the calibration didn't work down the far end. So when it went really super cool. So the other thing that we observed is the copper oxide was one large... Uh, amorphous blob and I was taught by Francesco Pintelli that he had to cool things at more than a thousand degrees centigrade to form a no crystal structure right otherwise you've got crystals forming so when I saw this I thought this is cooling almost instantaneously right and it, it matched the description where he said the air was sucking into the so they they have like it's in a, a, a alumina block the air is sucking in violently and he's hearing this crackling of, of the material and, and so it was a prediction I made. We ran the reactor, um, th this very different type of reactor. Um, and so basically what happens is, is the electrons, if you can imagine, they're in this cluster and they're, they're, they've lost their charge and so-called mass or, or whatever. When, when they blow up and re return to a non-Avogadro uh, per centimeter number type of electron density, they have to, they they get their um, Coulomb repulsion, they get their, 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 their repulsion back and they have to move out. And so, so do the atoms that have been trapped up in there. And as they move out, they move out in a sphere and you can literally see it on the video. The sphere moves out, it produces this intense light, of course, because it's charged particles moving through, you know, uh, and, and exciting matter, but it's a cold explosion. And the PAP engine ran cold, it ran cold because all the energy that went in came back out again. It was pushing stuff up the hill and it came back down, pushing stuff up the hill and came back down. Um, and it, it doesn't make any sense until you consider that these things can cohere energy from the vacuum. Now, um, when when um, th that's the basic method, there's another method that Alexander Parkhamov used, and it's like the Kozarev method for torsion fields that these things create, which is actually a toroidal moment um, in my view. He uses a reverse bias diode. So I talked about this as a detection method. And um, you can, and, and I, I've published a video on this and even shows the diodes that you can buy and how you would apply them. Um, but it's it's in Russian, but you can work it out. It doesn't take much effort. Um, and, and you get the current varying. So, it, but it's very, very slow. The method that I would like to work on with Brian Josephson, since he invented the thing, is the Josephson junction, because this can specifically observe the toroidal moment. And if you are having a basic plasmoid, um, it, it doesn't have what well, the, the very basic plasmoid just has a, a, a toroidal current. Uh, uh, sorry, um, it depends how you make it. If you make it from a discharge from a point, you end up with a current loop that goes into one big current loop, and then it has the diploidal magnetic field. That is not, it doesn't have a fractal moment. You need a minimum of two of them, a toroidal moment. You need a minimum of two of them, like Bostic was doing, 
So Bostic was creating a two plasmoids that have no toroidal moment, but he did a minimum of two joining together and a minimum of two creates a toroidal moment. And the, the basic devices you can use are squids, quantum qu qubits, and uh, uh, even more complicated devices. I'm I want to meet Brian Josephson and find a way to make the most simple Josephson junction and then a detection device. And then uh, whatever you're doing, improving the engine design, if you get that as good as you can get it, then you want to know what are the charge clusters? What are they doing? Are they big? Are they small? If we tweak this knob, if we tweak the flow rate, if we change the ionization we're using, are we getting bigger clusters? Is, is it beneficial up to a certain level of popping of reverse by diode by, by changing? Is it is it you know is the signal detected on the Josephson junction based device giving us some information that then we can iterate down to the best output? Yes, absolutely. Every single technology that produces over unity will be creating the toroidal moment. The toroidal moment is the basic two plasmoids coming together, absolute minimum. Any system that has charge separation with turbulence mm -hmm. will enhance the amount of uh, uh, toroidal moments that are generated and their complexity. And anything with standing waves in them will improve that as well. When you have ultrasound in water, which is one of the means by which Malcolm started his journey, yeah. numbers of uh, uh, plasmoids. Uh, uh, well, yeah, they, they, they're, they're fractal, so they're very small, but the overall structure that collapses is one in that case. It's a one macro structure. But the, the experiment that we do, the ultra experiment, which you probably are familiar with, that is an ultrasonic tank mm -hmm. with uh kitchen foil and water and it produces these structures all over the surface and we filmed them we, they it has the vortex we we've got the toroid and we know that it produces the we call it UT ultr it happened by accident we had some indium foil we put it into an ultrasonic cleaner to clean it and then we put it under the sem we for, saw three regular spaced explosions that had this same structure yeah. i think paps technology produced probably the most and and was the cleanest version of this technology its problem is you can't, you couldn't introduce carbon without it overheating i would imagine it would cease to function and then then um you had this risk that it always had to be grounding the plasmoids that it's generating because it over over generated them um, and it would ultimately, so like I have a sample here that I got from George Hathaway, this sample on this side, that one there. Um, mm -hmm. And under that, it, it's it's aluminium. And on it, it has this regular array, the same array that I was talking about in the channels on here, very similar. And it's aluminium, but in the center, it's synthesized up to 60% iron. And then it has a macro structure where in the center, it synthesized a sphere of, of copper. This is the yin force. The yang force will tear matter apart. And my tungsten is tearing tearing the, the it has a strontium ball and on one side, the same as the Om symbol, it has carbon. Um, and it's literally ripping carbon out and it produces all of the elements in the periodic table. Where I would, where I think I could benefit your project the most is really um, my analysis, potentially analysis, anal, ana, analyzing in particular, the chamber that you say has deformed. Now, when when the uh, Alexander Shishkin uh, and the team at Dubna, they state that ordinary matter, all of it has these condensed clusters already in them. And you can knock that out of them, which is what Tesla was doing to create his etheric matter streams by proper charge separation. And this will actually occur in your reactor itself like when it blows up those charge clusters there will be sufficient energies in there and not ordinarily in an ordinary engine they get chucked straight out of the exhaust in your engine you're passing the exhaust through the incoming fuel air mix right am i right in saying that what you're doing is some so what they established in russia is that you, for hydrogen it's two to four thousand times easier to create the cl condensed clusters of relic neutrinos, which are this this structure, 
um, than it is to do it with any element beyond lithium. So hydrogen is absolutely critical to this. And so, and because these things are in a way neutral, you will be, as, as the exhaust is coming out, you will be feeding your nascent charge clusters with a whole bunch of these things that come in. And so it's self-reinforcing. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, but every aspect of your system can be improved by understanding what makes these bigger and so forth. Now, why your cylinder is collapsing, I would imagine you have two things going on. One, the matter is trying to join with other matter with a macro cluster. And by that, I can refer you to this. That is the sacred geometry there. This is what I was referring to here. That's the center of the vortex, and that's the other one with a hole. Okay. On this side, it's it's shifted the material around. Okay. And the, the disruption zone, if I can get it there, is this triangle of it down the bottom there. That disruption zone. That's the same as the base of the Great Great Period. Under the a scanning electron microscope, the area directly outside of that is just brush brass. The area inside of that structure is a hexagonal array exactly like a, uh, 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 the model of the um, vacuum by, uh, uh, by Maxwell. And it's the same scale as these structures where the iron is in the center on the Hutchison sample, this one being from 1980. Exactly the same. It's the particular structures, and no metal is is immune, and yeah. but the, the metals oh, that are yeah. most problematic are spin nuclei. And if you can see here on the edge, this didn't kink and bend because of um, heating. It kinked and bending because of this force which was jellifying the metal. And it's exactly at the struct the the this sacred geometry. It's not slightly different. It's not completely different. It's literally exactly this. And in every system, we see this sphere radius, which is an event horizon. It's precisely located. It's not guesswork, and you need no maths to define it. And out in that area, it will slice up any material at all. But these things will push out, and they will collapse in. It's not heat. It's changing the electron bond within the metal. The electron bond is weird. It's not covalent. It's not uh, um, ionic. Uh, these electrons are able to move around in, in the whole material, um, but these things end up by influencing electrons over a wide area. And when they are interacting in this particular zone, and it, it, it's you can see it, we, we have videos that you can watch where we have tungsten, and it, it comes around, it forms a full spear ball, ball lightning on one end, and then that burns, it moves around, like 180 degrees, and I believe it's aligning with north-south in, in, in the magnetic field of the Earth, it then starts producing a resonant one at the other side. And then you can literally see the double layer. And it's only on the inside edge of the double layer does it go instantaneously slicing the tungsten off. But the ball lightning is still attached to the tungsten wire as it's going down. Like it's not in the same place and it's not connected electrically. But the ball lightning is still attached to the wire. But it sliced it off. So you need to operate in a sweet spot where you're producing the right size clusters, uh, the right number of the clusters. You're using them at the right level, but you don't comp compromise the integrity of the overall structure of the device. What's happening here is it's trying to fold itself in the next into the next quantization level. You may be aware that, that Ken Shoulders uh, uh, showed that he was able to melt, uh, um, a, a, what was it, uh, aluminium oxide and produce a fluidized aluminium oxide oh, under geez. a layer of canuba wax, which is like 53 oh. degrees or something. What, what I'm saying here is that the sacred geometry is absolutely precisely captured here. And this piece of metal, this iron here, so it, you only see one side, but it, it's 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 uh, oh god get my finger in the right place Th this bit is the, the top circle and then there's a circle below it and then there's this i can't, it's difficult to say oh. this it's sophic triangle um that is what was going on the underside of here and it was moving the spin copper around because this matter has spin this is what i'm talking about you you need to choose your elements correctly that don't have spin only and then i found all of the classified papers from russia and the U us were all based on this geometry
there's this sacred geometry thing. Why is everyone doing it? Let's do these drawings. I came from it. What's happening in this experiment, this experiment, this experiment, this experiment? What's happening in HHO? What's happening in cavitation? What's happening in cold fusion? What's happening? And then I saw all this under the SEM, all of this in literally 12 millimeters across. I can see it with my eyes in some of the reactors we have here. What is going on? Oh, it's this structure. Oh, it's what I've got in my bathroom. It's what's around the Acropolis. <laughs> it's 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 the symbol of Delphi, the Delphic uh, uh, um, double epsilon. Uh, it, it, it is the you cannot understand the weirdness of this journey. And then I, I go and see that the, in Karnak, they have these stylized pyramids and it's absolutely precisely correct. The actual inside geometry of every single aspect of the Great Pyramid is precisely. And more than that, what we produce in this, th a three year old can run this experiment. They need the skills of pouring water and pressing a button. And it produces exactly the same result every single time. It produces heavier elements on, on the yin force, and it produces lighter elements on the yang. This produces gravitational waves and de construction and de destruction of matter. One is a magnetic north monopole, and the other one is a magnetic south monopole, effectively. And this is what's going on in your reactor. And this is why it will do this folding of matter, and it's not thermal. It, it, it changes the uh, uh, vacuum properties such that electrons and, and, and quarks, they just don't behave like they normally do. So you get weird stuff. You get like what's going on in a, a sun, which, but it's it's happening in the in the plasmoid. So you get the CNO cycles, so you get protons going into carbon and producing oxygen. It's like, where's the oxygen coming from? The Hutchison effect is Lena, is the PAP device, is Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower. It is the Henry Moray's electricity generator. It is, it's it's all of the above. It's all all of the same thing. And it's so simple. It's absurd. It's so simple. And people have been trying to patent it and create their own little fancy inventions around it and pretend that they've invented something new. And it's literally in your face. The exact geometry is this. <laughs> this, this is what I have here. The little bit at the bottom there, where, where you see these Maxwell, this little bit there, which is exactly where it is in, in the pyramid, this little triangle there, and which we've seen in many, many structures, it's freaking written in your face. It's written. You, you literally cannot go anywhere of any sensible uh, ancient culture and not see this. You cannot not see it. Geometry, it costs $800 a day, but that is cheap because I used to rent the one just up the road from me, five minutes walk, and they charged me oh god $450 an hour and I, I had to watch someone else use it it's a large table it has 10 by 10 centimeters so you can give me sections up to 10 by 10 centimeters by eight centimeters deep and you are going to get the most beautiful images you've ever seen in your life and if you've got what's going on it will be it will be absolutely proven okay so I was describing the, the Shishkin Karol's Dubovic model of matter what causes perpetual motion in an electron? This was the second question I had in my life. Why does, if there isn't perpetual mode, mobile, why does electrons keep spinning around an atom, right? Okay. This condensed relic neutrino cluster, this multiple toroidal structure that they say is in matter, which is the hidden energy in matter that Tesla was releasing with his unidirectional discharges. It has a vortex toroidal moment, which ables to, is able to interact with the toroidal moment. And this is weird because you have to think of the, the relic neutrino condensates all at 2.76 Kelvin. It's the same at matter at the same wave function through the entire universe. It's one wave function. You input an information here at the other side of the universe. It's already there, right? There's no time delay because it's one wave function, okay? This is sucked in because although it's one wave function, it has... A particle nature to it. it has a toroidal moment okay so it is pulled in and if the atoms electrons are slightly under energized it will capture a very small amount only what it needs and it then will expect expel the uh, uh, cluster from the top if it has too much energy it, it shares this energy through the electron shells out into the cluster uh, into the overall coherent cluster what has been a uh, um there's a guy called Bob McElrath at uh, CERN Theory Group. group. And in in uh, 2010, he did a theory paper for CERN and suggested that relic neutrinos um, 
are a model for gravity and comply with um, uh, the uh, the generally accepted theories of everything else, right? Anyway, the point is this: if all matter, literally every baryon, every every nuclei there is, rather, if all of those things are capturing this material which is raining down from the cosmos and it goes through, it explains both gravity and inertia. But I explained to you some work by a guy called Xu Wenju. Xu Wenju and his team in China between 1988 and 1999 did a study of the effects on matter in three body alignments. He did. He found four effects, uh, which he published. I don't know whether he found more, but he found four. One was he took a brass sheet, like this brass sheet here, <laughs> a little bit thinner, and he hung it with weights on with strain gauges. And during three body alignments, like a lunar or solar eclipse, he noticed a sideways force. Why? Mm. Because relic neutrinos have a, they are slow and they have a wave function that means the, these are not the normal neutrinos that come out of matter when it, when you get decay, right? So forget those. These aren't the ones that don't get stopped by nine light years of lead. This matter gets partially reflected and partially diffracted and also gets interacts with ordinary matter. So if it's coming around, if you imagine my head is the moon, it's coming around and you get a higher density on the outside and a lower density here. And as I described to you the other day, it's like a fart in a room. Someone's farted over here and it's diffusing over here. So you get a sideways movement as it goes through the matter and it's pushing it. This implies it has a force. And this is comp complies with the pre-Einsteinian theory of gra gravity, where there are these infinitesimal particles that come down and they, they interact with matter. And it is easy to explain gravity that way. The second thing they observed is that when they took a lead tin alloy, it produced lines. Well, that's easy to explain with the diffraction pattern that you would get. The third thing that they observed is the spectral lines of atoms changes. That should not happen. What is a spectral line caused by? You excite the atom, the electron gets promoted, it falls down, it produces a photon, right? If it's producing a different line, if it's producing a different line, then for some reason, the atoms are either closer or further away, which means it, the flux of relic neutrinos, according to the Shishkins and Karols and Dubovic model, is either lower or higher, which you would get in a solar or lunar eclipse. Now, when I tested some Hutchison metal in Russia, in Sochi, in 2018, the inside of the aluminium sample, it didn't know what element it was. It didn't, because... It didn't. It didn't have all of the lines for any um, characteristic characteristic X rays, which implies the electrons are in the wrong place permanently. <laughs> the sample was produced in two thousand and seven. Now there is a guy called Leonid Oritskiev, and on Wednesday I will publish a paper that he will he will be presented. He was the guy that developed the gamma camera, this two ton camera that they flew over Chernobyl to try and find the uranium uh, after the so called meltdown. There was no uranium. Uh, underneath the reactor it was smeared through the entire reactor and very very weird effects happened there which had never been made public like bits of metal teleporting to other parts of the the, the, the thing <laughs> metal intersecting with other metal weird weird stuff he did a study in 2006 and he said the explanation for the weird glow that was observed by thousands and thousands of people in Prepyat over the reactor, which was not Cherenkov radiation, although that is the stimulation for it, was oxygen paramagnetically capturing these relic neutrino charge clusters, which they called, uh, I, I gave the name earlier, Loshek's uh, monopoles, okay? They're the same thing that we're talking about, okay? So these were binding to the oxygen and changing the spectral, they were changing the relationship where, where the electrons are. It's all the same thing. So, Essentially, you will possibly be able to see if you, this is another potential detection method, you might be able to have a, I don't know, sapphire window or something into your thunderstorm generator and possibly detect weird spectral lines. And I'm pretty certain you will be able to observe that. And it might be that with the combination of these various detection methods that I'm talking about, you will be able to optimize whatever the structure of the reactor is, the performance of the device, and wow. up to a point where it won't eat the reactor. 
because <laughs> it will eat the reactor sooner or later you'll get a sphere and inside that sphere everything will go it'll disappear <laughs> so you don't want to get to that point the answer yeah the answer is across every system that we look at so like we have lena reactor materials actually from that one that i went said went to minus 273 we put it on the 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 um the place up the road here two things i'll, I'll be with you in in a sec one one she's going around uh, uh, and and she's looking she says I've never had this before. I, I can't tell you what elements we're looking at here. And I sat next to uh, Alexander <laughs> Klimov, uh, uh, Anatoly Klimov in the, uh, after the 2018 conference. He's talking to a military guy, right? And he actually works on weapons and stuff as well. And he's saying the real problem is, Lena, is when it works, you can't even tell what the elements are you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> They're not normal elements because right. they've got these things bound into them. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, the, the other point was when she was firing the beam, she was seeing something. And then periodically, the entire SEM would be saturated with carbon atoms. And she goes, <laughs> sorry, I'm very sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. This never happens. Right. And I've got her on video saying it. Right. And because she's like a total expert at this. And what it is, is when you've got a charge cluster and it's stable, you and you fire the, the beam of electrons at it, it overexcites it the things blow up and the carbon payload that's trapped inside it, it gets untrapped and as soon as it comes out of the event horizon because it's intensely diamagnetic and you have an, an incredible magnetic field in these structures it gets kicked out so you get these boom, we got 100 percent carbon and then it dies back 100 percent carbon it dies back it's very weird to watch what what it is you you effectively have a monopole that's bound to the nuclei or to the molecule and it's it's affecting the way that the the shells can go to different energy levels. So that if if it's over energized, it's normally under energy. It's oh, normally too much magnetic charge on on the nuclei. It gets pulled in. It's normally with spin nuclei. So in an exploding foil experiment in two thousand and one, um, a, a, a Reutzkiff, the same Reutzkiff. Uh, he observed in iron 57 pure sheets of metal with a north pole on the back and on, at, at 0.7 meters outside of the reactor and a, another 0.7 meters or outside the reactor, a south pole uh, at 90 degrees to each other, you know, like that. Um, and a control that the, the fine moment under NMR was changed one way and changed the other way. So it is producing monopoles, 100% absolutely is producing monopoles that is what tom bearden said was what was going on in john hutchison and before i ever knew that uh, i worked it out from looking at john hutchison's sample and i said john i think this is producing monopoles he said oh that's funny that's what tom bearden said <laughs> <laughs> i go all oh, right yeah of course someone's got there first <laughs> But that's what it is. You, you have these uh, toroidal structures, and, and one is one way. It's the yang. It breaks matter apart. And one is the yin. And when you get these things, it actually, I have another, do I have another sample? I have another sample here with a ball lightning instantaneously removed a spherical section from a tubular copper pipe, right? So this is what I'm saying. If you get energized, it will just go, and it's gone, right? And on the boundary layer, you have these scallops. And inside the scallops, which are arranged, there are these hexagonal tubes where the material's churned up. And this is a very thermally and electrically conductive material. And why is it cut off like an event horizon? And on the boundary layer, you have these scalloped areas with these uh, weird churned up. Anyway, we, we're very close to completely understanding ball lightning. Ball lightning is a manifestation of the charge clusters. You can play nicely with it and you can't, like I say, because you've got carbon in there because of its diamagnetic nature. Because if you have a a, a ring, six, six hexagon ring of um, carbon that has delocalized electron, a benzene ring. If you have a delocalized engine and of course, benzene's got benzene rings in it, right? Um, <laughs> gas has got benzene rings in it, right? So like um, you have a delocalized electrons below and delocalized electrons above you effectively have a basic um plasmoid in there already and and so it's very good at resisting the the effect it, it ends up being part of it because but because it's diamagnetic it doesn't want to stay in but it kind of shields some of the nastiness that can go on so if you overdrive it the the system will overcome that 
Basically, Bockris and Sundarason replicated George Ossawa's 1970s experiments, verified it, and their assumption was oxygen-18 and, car and carbon were fusing to make helium and 56 iron. But the carbon doesn't like being in the system. What it is, is the 17 oxygen is synthesized, and I, I, I predicted that, and, and, and it's been verified at Taipei type, type University. Uh, but they only saw this neon-22 that was predicted, um, and I'm saying that the iron that we see in the ultra experiments in a, a hollow crenellated microsphere and which we see all over the, these in blown up ball lightning structures, the core, the magnetic core, ions and oxygen and all oxides of iron are magnetic. And that, I think, is iron 56 pure, almost certainly. And this is what George Oshawa made a patent for. And he was going to make special iron that was pure like it was stronger because it didn't have any different isotopes of iron in there, right? And it also didn't have any spin matter. So it's like resistant to the same thing attacking it later. It is it is the result. It, well, yes, we... actually, that might be possible, but you'd have to start with iron 56, which is plenty in there. But I don't think that's very likely because the you, you need uh, 57 mega electron volts per reaction to do that. It's not going to happen when you've already got light elements in there. The, the, with every yin you get a yang and within every yang you have a yin and a yang and within every yin you have a yin and yang it's fractal so it's just right. the, the top tier that does the assembly or, or the disassembly what was found by this guy in his steps to the, to the discovery of electronuclear collapse matsumoto he found um well i can i can read you the introduction it's very short but it's a good summary of 10 years of work Far in the universe, nuclear collapses very often happen to take place with the gravitational force after stars consume their fuel. Since the electromagnetic force is about 40 orders order stronger than the gravitational force, it should be easy to induce similar nuclear collapses by electromagnetic force in laboratory. But we never knew until now how to do that. Recently, the author discovered a nuclear collapse which was induced by electromagnetic force in laboratory during studying the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. Several kinds of nuclear reaction were directly induced in the electromagnetic force. The electronuclear reaction, ENR, was so found to occur in a special state of hydrogen clusters called, this is his theory, itonic clusters or micro ball lightning. The nuclear collapse was one of the most remarkable reactions among ENRs called electronuclear collapse, ENC. Furthermore, very amazingly, completely broken materials by electronuclear collapse were found to be regenerated to, uh, again to thin tubes and films of conventional elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. The latter process we called electronuclear regeneration. So it basically converts it into field forms of matter. And then depending on your system, it might just regenerate new atoms. And what is the most likely atom that you are likely to see? The most abundant element in the Earth's crust? Oxygen. Oxygen. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> the answer's there. Four and a half billion years of the Earth experimenting, it's already there. Push it hard, you get iron, and that's the core. And when we do these ultrasound experiments and we do these, we get an iron core with oxygen and then silicon oxide on the outside if you take silicon oxygen and iron you basically got almost all of the entire mass of the earth yeah that's it wow Let's see if you've got iron rich crenellated spheres at some point in your reactor so i would go through the non-magnetic structures in your reactor with a magnet with i don't know something covering it and just go e -e 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 like that and just see what you find Right, like that guy did out off the coast of uh, Papua New Guinea with a sled with the magnets on it. Right, see what you get, and then send that to me, or even just look at it yourself under an SEM. And I'm reasonably certain, not totally certain, but it it will be the same technology. There's only one option. It's the same. You know, I did have a poster behind here, me, but I gave it to the guy that did this work <laughs> at the conference. Right, um, it was a twenty micron iron rich crenellated microsphere which is in one of, one of the channels and in fact there's an exactly the same one just a few hundreds of microns away exactly the same skies looks exactly the same right um exactly the same looking structure was found in Histalin in Norway where a ball lightning was videoed colliding into the ground by an Italian team in 2003 in the soil where it collided they took it out they go we've got this very unusual iron rich crenellated microsphere what is this but this was found right so it is ball lightning. Ball lightning is EVOs. If you're creating EVOs above a certain size, we'll be creating some amount of iron. Obviously, when you're looking at gases, you're not going to be seeing iron, are you? You're going to be looking at gases.
right? So a lot of your material might be this. You have 1H1. 1H1 is a proton and an electron. It's atomic hydrogen. Atomic hydrogen has a slightly larger magnetic moment than the proton itself, okay? The cluster that you've generated has intense magnetic fields. It gets pulled in and because of its uh, uh, property, it aligns its magnetic fields with the cluster that you've created, right? So therefore, it's increasing the magnetic structure. Then you have oxygen. Oxygen doesn't matter whether it's atomic oxygen, diatomic oxygen, or uh, ozone, they all have a paramagnetic moment. Again, they join the cluster and they are focused through the center. If you look at this page on Murray B. King's uh, uh, quest for zero point energy here, and I've drawn what he's describing, it's a ring and a spot, Ra, the symbol of the sun. Also, uh, you know, uh, there we go. And, and that's it on the side profile. And he says, moreover, the residual ions can circulate around the EV vortex, electron dividing vortex ring. The ring symmetry would tend to aim in, in its center straight at the nucleus, and the ions circling through the center would be aimed directly at the nucleus with further force. That is not it. The toroidal moment organizes matter into a sphere in the center, and it has intense gravitational force. Intense. And it causes exactly what this guy observed. And he even has a freaking diagram of it published in 2000. It's, it's right here. He has a toroidal structure which produces a singularity. And in the singularity, there we go. Right. And it produces a generation of a carbon film, but there's a wormhole and it comes out and, and it comes out and it comes out as common elements like carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen uh, in the re regeneration. And this is what we observe. And it doesn't matter who you look at, Brown's gas. At 1987 or 6, in a, in a newspaper article, he's saying, I put my radioactive material and I put it on there and I get predominantly carbon synthesized. That's the stuff he can see there because the gas goes off, doesn't it? <laughs> the bit that you can see is carbon. So it easily what? transmutes matter. If you go too far, it will transmute matter. It will synthesize carbon and carbon will thermalize the coherent matter. So you go through a, a transition. So like when I'm saying the Amasa gas earlier on when I was describing it, if you if you don't have carbon, then it will do melt. It'll it'll eat through metal. It'll fuse metals together. Weird weird stuff like that by changing the way electrons interact in a metal. Okay, but if you push it too hard, so we have a piece of indium. It was hair thickness. I chose the the. The lowest melting point metal that didn't combust in air. And I took a shim, the thickness of a human hair, and then I exposed the same Amasa gas that we literally just so called vaporized tungsten and cut holes through titanium. And it turned it to a rubber sheet and it's flapping around in the, in the, the intense jet, right? This melting <laughs> 156.6 degrees. <laughs> but then it gets overloaded and it, it starts forming carbon and silicon and oxygen and iron and those elements the carbon particularly then starts thermalizing it and then it melted and under the sem you literally see what looks like a volcano and in here he says volcanoes are probably doing exactly the same thing i didn't know that but anyway um in in he, he's he, there is like a magma chamber the magma chamber is an evo a cluster that's under the ground and then it collapses and when it collapses it produces an intense release of energy and it, it the volcano is literally looks like a volcano like and out of it you have this in, initial explosion which comes down as pure indium oxide so that's melted vaporized oxidized in the air recondensed and comes down as beautiful beautiful pure indium oxide octagonal stru structures and then out of the center of this volcano you go silicon dioxide iron liquid fluidized carbon these are all melting points that are so incredibly above the melting point of indium right, right. intense energy release and that is what finally causes the destruction the magnetic charge comes from this and when i when i actually observed the fractal toroidal structures in this sample and sent it to the russians they threw in the towel they 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 sent me this paper by Zverblis. And what they showed is that during taking, 
If you have current going through a wire, it has a pointing vector that comes off and it dissipates. If you have pointing, uh, if you have current going through a toroid, uh, a like a, a helical wire, right? Not not a toroid, a, a solenoid, then the pointing vector comes off and dissipates. If you have a solenoid wrapped into a coil, the pointing vector comes off and it dissipates. But if you have a coil of a coil of a coil, the pointing vector, if you look at standard Maxwell equations from the turn of the 1900s, done by Nevesky in 1993, and replicated without knowing it by a Slack researcher called David, David Freiberger in 2009, the pointing vector goes into a loop, a single loop. And you can energize that, and you can energize that, and energize it. And you can remove the thing that energized it to the other side of the room, and it's still there. And it will persist for around about two days, right? And this has been observed in the same plasma flow discharges where they've seen an Evo, like a plasmoid, moving around for two days on video, glowing and producing light. And when this was published, a military guy in the US said, we were doing laser, uh, sorry, electron beam processing of um, aluminium or alloy landing gear for military aircraft. It was a classified process, right? Uh, and it was designed to make the metal like a super metal, like really hard, like the Hutchison stuff where it's weird, right? <laughs> and they, they said they found these glowing spots on there. And they just, they thought, well, we don't know what they are. So we'll just get a, a wire brush and we'll rub them <laughs> off. So he went back to the guys that he used to work for in the military and, and said, look, did you look at this? And they said, oh, yeah, actually, we did look at this. And we found that these things were still there two months later, glowing oh. on a piece of metal. Uh, do you know yes, how, how much, much light was, was given off? off? It's enough to capture easily on camera and still see like the, the background. Now, the wow. thing is that if you have a, a coil of a coil of a coil of a coil, a fourth order tor, you have a pointing vector that closes like that and a pointing vector that closes at 90 degrees to it. And if this one collapses, this one it, uh, uh, happens. And you end up by producing electromagnetic vacuum structure, a true exotic vacuum object, which is not relying on any condensed matter. And this can produce some of the weird effects that's going on because it sits in metals indefinitely.